30. Those of you staying here in the auditorium, let's jump in our Bibles and let's head over to Revelation chapter 16. While you're turning to Revelation 16, let's answer just a few odd and goofy questions. Name a body part that often gets broken. Finger, arm, leg, nose. Okay, here's what the, the survey said. Finger, toe, leg, your heart. Ah, uh, and the number one was the arm. Name a boat you could not water ski behind. Rowboat. <laughs> what else? Any other boats? What? A tugboat. Okay. Ocean liner. Here's what they said. Okay. Banana split boat. Okay. Submarine, that would be a tough one. Battleship, cruise ship, sailboat, and number one was rowboat. Yeah, the number one. Name a type of repairman you'd call in an emergency. <coughs> Air conditioning, electrician, any others? Yeah, here's what they said. Electronic guy, roofer, car mechanic, septic repair, absolutely. Electrician and plumber was number one. Uh, goofy things. Name things people put inside birthday cards. Money. Gift cards. Glitter. Don't you love the cards that come glitter and you open and you weren't prepared for it? <laughs> We, we had a lady in our church who was very habitual in putting glitter and confetti. And after a couple times, I learned. Okay, open it, open it close to a container. Confetti, glitter, gum or flat candy, personal note, gift card, money was number one. Give a word that you often hear after Holy, Holy Spirit. Holy cow. <laughs> this is a religious one, so nobody said cow. I, that was my first thought too, but... <laughs> Holy, what? Holy Trinity? Holy, holy, holy? Okay. That's not up there, but that's a good one. What's that? Holy mackerel. <laughs> See, I go, my mind goes that direction. This one, they said this, holy lands, Trinity, Holy Ghost, Holy Bible, and Holy Spirit. By the way, just for information's sake, in the Bible, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit... They're the same thing. It's just choosing how you want to interpret it. Uh, the pneumos is the word. Describe the trumpet judgments. What's the first one? We only studied this last week. Okay, so it's, it's been seven days ago we talked about it. Okay. What's the first trumpet judgment? It's in Revelation 16, if that helps. Okay. The hail's not the first. Okay. The first one is the sores on the body. Then what happens? Do you remember any others? Forget the order. Do you remember any others? Okay, how's the water? Which, which waters? The sea becomes as a dead man's blood. And then what happens? The fresh water turns into blood. And then what happens? Okay, then there's the intense heat by the sun. And then you have the darkness that affects the extreme darkness. And then you have the Euphrates drying up and the armies come marching through from the, uh, from the east into, this, into the Middle East. And there's this great battle of, what's that great battle called? Yeah, so that's all taking place. So let's pick up where we left off again. If you're unfamiliar with the timeline, we are, everything is headed for Messiah returning, Jesus' second coming, second of his kingdom. The last seven years before that, it starts with the signing of a treaty. There's three and a half years of peace for Israel. They will hear rumors of wars. They will hear about the famines, but they themselves will be semi uh, uh, protected from all that, but the rest of the world's going into chaos. There's the growth 
towards a one world system and then what happens is Satan is ousted out of heaven at the middle of this time when he comes to earth he comes with great wrath and so he empowers the Antichrist who I think he raises from the dead literally and uh, they break the covenant with Israel and then he sets up his world kingdom in those last three and a half years that's when 666 is in place that's when it's the one world religion that's when the intense persecution during all this time then uh, what happens is there's several different judgments the seal judgments are in the first part the trumpet judgments are throughout the second half and then the third set of judgments that we're talking about uh, last week and this week is the bowl judgments they occur towards the very end if we were to lay it out this way they seem to be clustered right before the return of Jesus Christ right before the end of that time and so these seven bowl judgments if you remember where we were talking about them last week in chapter 15 and 16 uh, John sees angels coming out of the temple they're carrying these bowls and as they leave the temple uh, he says he he is told that the beast one of the creatures living beasts from before the throne Revelation chapter uh, 4 is handing out these bowls to these or these plagues to these seven angels that they come out and John also notes that behind them is the smoke of the glory of God so what he's making clear is these come from God from his throne God is involved God sanctioning these different judgments and the question comes and we talked about just briefly last week but I want to rehearse it again why does God approve of such severe judgments and he's already set the scene through the book of Revelation he um, and he says it right in the middle of these judgments he says righteous and true are your judgments and so the peoples may be questioning maybe the readers are questioning maybe believers at that time saying God why are you so harsh with the people and if you recall we've already had the scene set from chapter 13 he said that everybody's worshiping Satan or Antichrist uh, in one they have shed the blood of the Saints that and mentions it right in the middle of this judgment that he makes that comment because they have shed the blood of Saints they shall drink blood and so we read about that several times we read about how they, through the period of the tribulation, that they have gone after, they have slain those who have a testimony, and we read about that at the very first judgments in, uh, in the uh, first part of the book, first part of the tribulation. The two prophets that were there, that everybody knows they're prophets of God, they attack them, they kill them, they leave their bodies in the streets. We know that... Uh, that uh, the 144,000, their followers, he talks about those who came out of the tribulation, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Talks about those people no longer suffering. They've been persecuted during the tribulation. In chapter 12, he talks about Satan coming to the earth and how he's going to attack, and even those who did not love their lives, and they died. We read in Revelation chapter 12, we read about uh, Satan going after the woman or Israel and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. We read in chapter 13 how Antichrist makes war with the saints to overcome them. We read in chapter 14 again, did you get the flow of the book? repeatedly he's telling us the saints will be persecuted he said blessed are the, those who died in the Lord Revelation 16 he makes it very clear they have shed the blood of saints and so they the people who are going to suffer during these these plagues they have been guilty of killing God's people in mass by the hundreds and we've read already in the passage in chapter 14 they are filled with rottenness that the society is corrupt. And again, the other thing that is repeated through several passages is these people keep on blaspheming God. They keep on not repenting. We found that all the way back in chapter 9, that they, uh, they, stop, they would not stop worshiping the different idols, and they did not repent of the murderers or the sorceries or the sexual immorality. We read about how um, the Antichrist, he will cause everybody 
ready to worship him. They don't follow the Lord. An angel said, the city has fallen because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of her fornication, of her evil. Uh, he is told, thrust in the sickle because the time is right because the harvest is totally rotten. In chapter 16, he says it again, they blaspheme God because of their pains and sores and did not repent. So God is clearly saying it is an evil, evil time. People are not repenting. But what is amazing is God keeps on giving them chance, keeps on giving them warnings. The book of, uh, book of Revelation isn't just about judgments, it's about grace. That God would give people, I mean, seriously, God's grace to us is amazing. God's grace to these people who are just consistently rejecting, and some of them will get saved. And so you look and say, in the book of Revelation, how does God show grace? Who does he send to preach the gospel? Who are some of the people? Okay, first ones are the 144,000. Any others? Okay, he's got the two prophets. They're going to preach. Anybody else preaching the gospel? The angel, the angel that preaches the everlasting gospel, that's going to be clear. And um, in Matthew, Jesus said this. He said, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached where? To all the world, unto all nations, before the end comes. Okay, that's a tribulation passage. It's not a passage dealing with us today. But that tribulation passage makes it clear the gospel is going to be presented. God will give everybody a chance so that they cannot say that they are without excuse. As well, there is the warning of the judgments. The, several times in the judgments, they say they know it's God. But what do they do? They, they reject him. They blaspheme. But they know he's behind it. So they have these warnings. And there's another really impacting witness. It is the witness of the gospel even in these days. For people or you leaving behind a gospel witness, letter, video, whatever, they can be impacting as well. So God in his grace is giving a chance. Now we've talked about the bold judgments as we just get into number seven. Let's just remind ourselves they are very similar to some of the previous judgments except for they're bigger. They're broader. They're, they're uh, happening at the end of the tribulation. They're far more severe, like the trumpet judgment that affected one-third of the seas. The bold judgment affects all the seas. The trumpet judgment that affected one-third of the drinking water, the bold judgment will affect all the drinking water. So they're far more severe, and uh, they seem to be very sudden one after another. And we talked about it already. We did this a moment ago. And so we were going to fill in the blanks here. The first one is the sores, the pain. The salt waters get polluted. The fresh waters turn to blood. Intense heat, extreme darkness. And then the Euphrates is dried up. The armies are going to be manipulated by the kings, uh, by the demons, the three frogs, the demon-like creatures that appear as frogs, like frogs. The eastern armies will invade, and they gather for the Battle of Armageddon for that great day. So that's where we're at up to this point. And then we read in Revelation chapter 16 these words, verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of God from the throne saying, It is done. There were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Let's stop right there. Make several observations that are very important. Okay? Um, this one is going to be different than the others. We take so much for granted. They're all being affected by that time. This one, oops, excuse me. This one now, something that's going to, that is kind of non-dependable is the weather. And this one's going to be, the weather is going to be affected by it. All the other things that people take for granted, they're going to be affected. And he says that there, this last one is like never before. Now as it starts, this trumpet, he says that he pours his vial into the air. I don't know exactly how this falls, uh, carries out. There's two possibilities that are interesting. Who what domain does, say it, does Satan rule? Okay, he's the god of the air. Okay, is this, uh, is this purposely done as an attack against Satan? That's a possibility. Is it as well just simply that it's being poured out in the sky above? Or is it both? 
Just food for thought. I, I don't have a total answer for that. But he says, as the angel pours out this vial upon the air, there's a great voice that comes out of heaven. Whose voice is it? Verse 17. Why would you think it's God's? Okay, it's coming from, yeah, he, he makes it clear that it's coming there from the, from the throne itself. And if it's coming from the throne in heaven, okay, he's the throne sitter. So it seems to me that God is saying, is speaking. What does he say? It's just a simple phrase. It is done. What's that mean? It is a very similar phrase that Jesus cried on the cross. It is finished. Tetelestai. It's not the same word, but it's the same structure that has the idea it is done and it's going to stay done. It was paid in full and it's going to stay paid in full. God is saying at this moment it is done and so the tense that he uses has this idea this is it. This is the final and when it's done it's done. Okay? which gives you the indication who's in charge. Okay, God is totally in charge. This is, again, from God himself. And this fits the rest of the text, because in chapter 15 he starts talking about these seven bold judgments, and he says this is the seven last plagues. He's already mentioned that. And so these are the last, the final judgments. And so he makes that comment. And if we back up again to chapter 15 and, and, and look at the last phrase of verse 1. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. Literally, it reads, for in them is the conclusion or the end of the wrath of God. And so he's already stated that. Now God reaffirms this. This is the last of the plagues and the judgments that is going to come and bring everything to completion. Now I, I remind you why this is significant. All the way back in chapter 5, there was a scroll held up. And the question was, who is worthy to open the scroll? And we pointed out that that scroll, uh, with all of its judgments, could and gave the idea of bring, could be bringing something to completion. Who is worthy to handle all of these judgments and bring them so that ultimately we come to the kingdom of God? And so this is a statement that seems to be going and coinciding with that, is that the Lamb of God takes the, the um, scroll, he is carrying all these out, and he's going to bring everything to completion, the last plagues, and right after the last plagues is the second coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the kingdom. So God is saying, this is it. It's going to stop um, at the end of this final judgment. And so he pours the, the uh, bowl into the air, and there are, and I put the original word down, there are, according to verse 18, there are sounds, phonai, okay? Phonai, thunders, and lightnings. Different possibilities of what this means. Okay, because the way it's translated at other spots. Is it the possibility of, what do you have in your Bible? I have voices. What do you have? Anybody have something else? Rumblings? Okay, okay, so you can see different people interpret it and understand it with what does that phonai mean. Sometimes it's been translated as voices earlier. Sometimes it's translated as loud noises and so we can't go back and say okay well you know which one it's it's um it's both sounds could it be that there's activity in heaven that's what he's describing as the angels are going out all of a sudden god's majesty and glory like has been described earlier that there has been the thunderings the lightnings the loud noises around the throne of god or is this uh the idea of there is going to be actual storms in the air. There is going to be thunder like never before. There's going to be lightnings, and there's going to be, um, you know, this rumbling that's just, I don't know which one it is. Okay, you can decide for yourself. I'm not sure it makes a whole lot of difference at this point. But there's some activity happening in the sky or in heaven itself. And then there's the great earthquake. And that's what seems to be the focus of this one. He says that this earthquake, how does he describe it? 
an earthquake that is how big? How big? N never, there's never been an earthquake at all. And remember, there was a time on earth that the, uh, the oceans and the earth burst forth. And there was huge amounts of earthquakes that let out the waters and caused the devastation of the flood. Okay, and so he's saying that this is unlike anything. The result of the earthquake, he goes on, he talks about the result is the great city is divided into three parts. The cities of the nations, they fall. Great Babylon comes into remembrance, etc. Verse 20, every island fled away. The mountains were not found. And then there's even more that happens in the next few verses. Who, what's the great city? The great city is divided. There's two different possibilities. Already in the book of Revelation, there have been two great cities. That's the term used for them. Do you know who they are? Babylon has been called a great city. Jerusalem has been called a great city. They've both appeared already in the book of Revelation as being called the great city. So the question is, which one is it? We don't know from John's statement um, in that sense. It seems to me that if you take other scripture and you take this verse itself and look, he talks about the great city and then he talks about Babylon. I think he's making a distinction. And as well, previous prophecies have already indicated that Jerusalem will suffer a great, great massive earthquake and a change of its topography. Now, both of these cities have been mentioned. But in Zechariah chapter 14, he talks about on that day his feet will stand at the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, which is not the way that the valley is formed at this time. And so at Christ's coming, there's going to be this huge split and change within the Middle East, uh, the makeup around Jerusalem. And so that is a huge earthquake. What happens is the people, the remnant, come out of Jerusalem and flee to the Mount of Olives. This gives them that way to do that, to flee to Jesus Christ for him to be able to rescue them. And so you have this, if I understand right, you have that earthquake taking place, which is right at the coming of Jesus Christ. You also have the, cry, the cities of the nations falling. So it's clearly indicating that this earthquake is not an isolated earthquake. The earthquake is not like we hear about an earthquake in India or we hear about an earthquake in Ohio or we hear about an earthquake in San Francisco We hear, and it doesn't affect us. This passage says how much of the world is affected by this earthquake. All of it because cities are going to fall multiplicity of them. And so then he talks about that idea, great Babylon is going to experience the fierceness of God's wrath. He's already mentioned great Babylon back in chapter 14. If you remember verse 8, he said, as the angel crying out, there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So clearly in chapter 14, verse 8, Babylon is a bad, bad spot. It is a sin city. Well, now he repeats that again in verse 19. He says that Babylon will come into remembrance before God and God will pour out his wrath. So Babylon is given a real negative connotation. Okay, what else do we know about Babylon? Nothing in this book. Nothing has been stated but those two verses. But the whole next chapter is going to deal with it. And so he's given us this opening information about God's judgment. And then he makes comment here, every island will flee, every mountain will, not be, will disappear. Is this part of the topographical, geographical changes that are going to take place to prepare the world for the kingdom? Um, I'm not sure, okay? I know that shortly after this, yes, the world is going to be renovated. It's going to be totally different than what it is right now so that we will be able to have an abundance of people living on uh, planet Earth and the seas and everything will have been changed. But my question is, if, um, you know, if this whole situation is happening, what do people do? You're li not, you won't be if you're saved, but if somebody's living in that time period and they're living in Hawaii, what happens? Okay, where are they going to go? They're dead, yeah. 
The islands are dropping away. What if you're living on a mountain? Okay, where are you going to run for safety? If the mountain is collapsing around you, what do you do? And so he's describing just a horrific time that's going to be just damaging to the people living in that time period. Then he adds to it, on top of the ground is going out from under you, literally, the sky is falling, literally. Because he makes this comment, he says, there fell a great hail, uh, hail out of heaven, and he gives you the measurement, the weight of the hail. How much is the hail? Okay. Okay, it's giving you a talent, okay? Measurement of ancient, ancient times. You're talking about hail that is uh, approximately anywhere from 90 to 130 pounds. That's a huge hailstone. I mean, that's massive. Now talk about people blaspheming God, which we've said that they've, we've pointed out. They keep on doing this. What was the Old Testament punishment for blaspheming God? You're stoned. Okay, Leviticus. So these hailstones are falling. The largest hailstone recorded when, since records have been kept is how heavy? This is a guess. What's that? Three pounds, five pounds. Any others? 30? Okay. The highest one was two, just over two pounds. And that's the size of it. Now, imagine a 100-pound hailstone. Where are you going to hide? What building is going to protect you? You're going to get in your car and drive away. If that thing hits your car, you know, the people are just, it, it's, it's an amazing situation that that hail will have upon the people. And then he concludes it with this statement. He says, this plague is exceedingly great. So he's called them plagues before. Now he says this one is exceedingly great. How would you, how would you put that in different words? It's the worst? Okay, good. And so he says it one more time. What do men do when the hail is falling, the islands are disappearing, the mountains are crumbling? What do people do? They repent and call to God. No, what's it show you? They blaspheme God because of all this. They're still anti-God. Again, we're, we're seeing once again the intensity of the human sin nature. How corrupt we can be if it wasn't for the work of grace in our hearts. How bad we would be. And so these people are experiencing all this. Again, we've said that they're clustered. What's the next event historically, that happens at the end of these, of these judgments. What's the next thing? Anybody want to guess? Okay. At, in the, at the, involved in the Battle of Armageddon, who puts an end to the battle? What's he do? Okay, Jesus Christ comes down from the sky with his army. So at the end of these, with this earthquake, this hail, Armageddon is taking place, which uh, number six, at the end of all this, the, the, the it is done is Jesus coming to back. He's coming back. Now, the chapter doesn't say that. The book does. If, if you go through the chronology of the book and put an outline on the book, here's what you've got. The first couple of chapters we're, we're jumping right over. It's introductory. It's who the book is to. But when he starts seeing future events, chapter 4 and 5, John's in heaven. He sees God. He knows who's giving him the information. And he's getting the idea that Jesus Christ is in control. He worthy is the Lamb. He's going to open up the, the seals. And so then the next section of the book is the seal judgments. He's talking about these, these seven different judgments that take place. In the midst of them, the 144,000 are described giving out the gospel. Then, he, in the next sec major section of the book, he's talking about the tr uh, trumpet judgments in the second three and a half years. And in the middle of that, he talks about how God, in the middle of this judgment, is reaching out to people. He sends the two prophets, but the people reject and they turn to Antichrist because of Satan's influence and the false prophet. But yet, God still 
as you follow the chapter by chapter, God still wants them to repent and gives them a chance by sending the 144,000 and then the angel preaching the gospel. And then you come to this section that says at towards the very end of that three and a half years, the second half, towards the end of the, the, the follow-up to the trumpet judgments is seven worse judgments. And God is wanting them, and we've just talked about what they are. And then the book tells you Jesus Christ will come back at the Battle of Armageddon. It gives more information a little bit later on. Oh, it should go this way. A little bit more information later on that tells you about that battle and exactly what happens. But he's revealed that this is going to happen. But he gives us more detail later. And then at the end of the book, he says he's going to set up his kingdom. And he describes the kingdom and gives us detail about it. There is something missing, what I've given you in this outline. What's missing? There's two chapters missing. 17 and 18. Okay? 17 and 18, what he's going to do is he's described what are the, the judgments, what are the trumpet judgments, but in those two, he's going to give you more detail who is being judged. He's given us only two references to Babylon. So now what he does is he does another parenthetical thought and he says, I'm going to give you more information about Babylon. I'm going to give more information about how, how bad Antichrist is in this second period. And so chapter 17 and 18 is describing in the midst of all of this judgment, we're going to take a break and we're going to talk about what were these people like in the last three and a half years so that they deserve this judgment? And chapter 17 and 18 adds to the idea that they're blasphemous, that they're evil. So chapter 17 takes us into a section that is really interesting. Now, set the scene for it. We have already read in the book that there's going to be a one-world government. Who has promoted this? Who has established the one-world government? Okay, Satan's been promoting it. Who's the people he uses? Antichrist and the false prophet, okay? So he and his demons have been manipulating this. We've heard about that, how they are doing that. We've heard about how Antichrist and the false prophet are the human instigators behind this. Satan's the spiritual instigator. And we've heard about it as well, that there's going to be great spiritual deception and force to get all the masses to follow this one world system. Okay, there's spiritual deception, there's demons, there's false teachers. What force does Antichrist and the false prophet use to promote this system? The number, and if you don't take the number, what's the force? You don't eat, you don't buy anything, and you die. Okay, so he's given us that information already. He's given us about how there's going to be this tremendous, um, uh, what do I, um, encouragement. Okay, that sounds too positive. This tremendous incentive to follow after Antichrist. The incentive very simply is, <laughs> you get to live in this time period, okay? But to, from people, if they love their lives, they're going to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to follow Antichrist. And so if we were to describe what we know so far, just a little bit, without all the details that's going to come up, we would say this entire one world system is what type of force? Is it military? Do they use armies? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they're using forces because we've already read he's a god of war that nobody can stand against him. Do they, is it a spiritual entity? Do they use spiritual forces? Okay, are they a political entity or force? Yeah, so if we were to put it down, it's political. Is it a financial force? Yeah, so it's financial, political, religious. Religious is false religion. But it's, it's, this, it's this impacting force. What he's going to do in this next chapter is tell you about how it got that way. Who were some of the other key players? It wasn't just Antichrist and the false prophet. There are other subordinate characters that helped get false prophet and Antichrist where they were. And so he's going to describe them and give us more detail. And as the angel basically says, hey, I want to do a, a tour 
of a little bit of history. Let me back you up, John. Let me give you some details. He's going to describe, in particular, a harlot, a beast, and ten kings. Now, have we ever heard about a beast before? Have we ever heard about ten kings before? Not in the book of Revelation, but in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, we've talked about that. Okay, so he's going to now bring it all together, and this is where you get the information that really gives you the details of how they came to be to power. And so let me start off saying I have an idea I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, you know, say 120%, I'm sure what this harlot is, but I have an idea. And there are different people have different conclusions who the harlot is. I'll tell you who mine is, and you can do with whatever. But let's stick with the Bible and say, okay, starting with this harlot, who is a key player in getting Antichrist to power, it says this. There came, verse 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked to me, saying, Come hither, I'm going to show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away into the, in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Can I pause? Has there ever been a woman in visions up to this point? Who's the woman? Do you remember? Israel. Israel. Is this the same one? Okay. We're going gonna, gonna to read further. Don't, don't conclude. For instance, the great city, don't conclude it's always Jerusalem. We've already pointed out. The Bible says Babylon. You can't conclude that every time a woman shows up in the book of Revelation, it's Israel. You've got to read the entire context. And when you read the entire context, it's going to become clear this is not Israel. He goes on. He carried me away. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names and blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Have we ever heard about seven heads and ten horns? Yes or no? You got a 50-50 chance. Yeah. Yes, we have. You took the right chance. Okay. Who has seven heads and has been described seven heads and ten horns? There's two characters. The dragon and the beast. The dragon is Satan. Who is the beast? The Antichrist. The difference between them is the number of crowns. But it doesn't say that at all here. And so he, uh, he says, seven heads, ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Just looking at that verse, this wo how would you describe this woman? Opulent? Okay. Is she wealthy? Yeah, it seems to be all, all the description, she's very wealthy. What else is she? Not only wealthy, she seems to be a pretty wicked woman. Okay? So we'll come back to that filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head, forehead, okay, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots and abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. What does that tell you she's done? She's killed. She's, she's martyred. And with the blood, oh, there it is. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, astonishment. Yeah, that's an unfortunate. The admiration gives a very positive. What the prophet is saying is, I was amazed at this. This was stunning. Um, not in a positive way, okay? And the angel said unto me, Wherefore do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. So he's using symbolism. This is one of those tough passages that we say, what is it? So let, let's just describe, first of all, she's a great whore. What does that say to you? What, what's the, how would you describe her character? Unfaithful, evil, okay? Very immoral, very wicked. She's described as sitting upon many waters. Any guesstimate? Okay, the waters, you're saying that the waters could be the people of this world. 
okay? Which means, and if she's sitting upon, she's got great influence, which is going to be highlighted through this passage that she has some influence, very great power over the waters, and the question is, the waters, and we go a little bit further in verse 15, the waters which you saw where the whore sits are who? Who do you have in verse 15? The peoples, multitudes, nations, and so it's the world. It's the world population living at that time. And he's used this idea already that basically describes the people who are the lost people of that time period. So this passage, which is really cool, this passage is not leaving you to guess. It's going to give you the interpretation. He says that the, she's sitting upon or influencing a lot of the nations in the world, which Okay, this character, whoever she's representing, or characters, whatever she represents, has had worldwide influence on many different governments and people. Verse 18 tells you what she is. The woman which you saw is what? That great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So far we've read of two great cities. Jerusalem and Babylon, okay? And so it's like, okay, did the Jews ever reign over all the peoples of the earth? No, okay. Have the Jews committed fornication? Yes, they have, okay. But there's more to this great city, okay. In verse 2 we get a description. So we have a city that has had influence, a city or a city system, that has had influence over many peoples of the earth, talking about how she's not only sitting upon the waters, but she went a-whoring with the kings of the earth. She had an, a relationship, an affiliation with civil authorities, uh, working out evil uh, with politicians and politics, okay? And according to verse 18, she will reign over the kings of the earth. There's going to come a point that she is going to become the world ruler in the end times, which is like you and I go, wait a minute, how can this be? Antichrist is supposed to be the world ruler. But how did he get there? This is giving you the background information. Somebody ruled before him and helps get him established. And so this is giving you that background information. The angel says she's intoxicated the inhabitants of the earth with her fornication. Again, influencing the masses with the wickedness. You've already pointed out the purple, the scarlet, the gold, the precious stones. Indicative that she's not only opulent, okay, bragging about it, but she has great wealth. This city has great, great wealth behind it. She has a golden cup in her hands, again wealth, filled with abominations and filthiness, okay, is this city, this woman, does it represent something that is good? No. Does she represent something that is corrupt? Okay, very much so. Uh, corrupt, worldly, I, I put down, she's down and dirty. Okay, whatever she is. Uh, what stands out about the city? Wealth and wickedness. Very, very predominant in this text, in the symbolism. She is riding on, what does verse 3 tell you? She's riding upon a beast full of names and blasphemy. And again, seven heads, and we've mentioned this, the same are what's described of Satan, same number of heads and horns that are described of Antichrist. What's that mean? She's closely aligned with them at some time to some degree. There is thought pattern, there is um, affiliation, there is the same type of attitude, mindset, the killing of, of the innocents. Uh, she is called, verse 5, Mystery Babylon. Oh, now we get Babylon back in here, which has been described as the great city that God's uh, put his fierceness. So different scholars have different opinions of how to describe this Babylon. Is this a rebuilt ancient Babylon on that same site? that becomes the leading world city, okay? Is this um, a spiritual Babylon, another city that is Babylon-like, 
By the way, is there another, is there another city in the world that the Scriptures calls Babylon, but it's not where Babylon was? Rome. The city of Rome. It's mentioned in 1 Peter as the, uh, the corrupt Babylon. Is this a city that is a, a city system? And let me see if I can put it this way. We talk about Wall Street. Are we talking just about that street? What are we talking about? The whole, everything associated with it. So different people look and say, is this ancient Babylon rebuilt? Is this different than the rebuilt city? Because it's a mystery. Is it a new city, a different city that wasn't ancient Babylon because the word mystery? Was it called a mystery because John didn't see it yet? And it's unknown to John in 95 AD. Is it a system more than just a city? And all of that is like, okay, uh, let's, let's run with it. Where does it go? And again, I remind you that Rome has been called, the, been referred to as Babylon in previous uh, epistles. And so what exactly is it? I want to just keep going. Either revive Babylon uh, that's going to happen in the future or another city with similar characteristics, found foundation, influences. It's one or the other. Okay? We, so we go on and we say, um, she's called the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. What's it mean to be the mother of harlots? What's that tell you? What's that? I had two at once and I'm not getting either. The worst of the worst? Okay. Okay, you're both saying the same thing. Okay. She, she has offspring. Okay. She's, she's fostered other corrupt, corrupt entities. Okay. That have felt, so the cities, uh, this city, this system, this religious being, whatever it is, has spawned other false systems. Uh, they will be responsible for, for spreading falsehoods as well and abominations globally. Similar, the harlots will be uh, of crimes, including martyring the saints of God. Okay? So we know that. We've already mentioned about her fornications with the kings, but something else is stated down in verse 6, I believe. She kills many of the true believers. She is against the truth of the gospel. And so, eventually, what happens to her? Okay, what happens to her is, go down to verse 16. The ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these, are, these hate the whore. They shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. There's more to this prophecy, but she's going to be hated by other political entities that are in play in that, three, in that middle of the tribulation. She's going to be hated. The, those leaders, those ten horns working with the beast, what will they do? They will destroy her. So this is an entity that is leading up to the middle of the tribulation that she has had influence for years and years and years. And uh, basically she's going to exist up until the middle of the tribulation. Then she's going to be taken out and her, but she will have she will have gained power for just a short period of time. She's going to be taken out, and whatever power she had, those ten kings will give it to Antichrist. So that's the summary of, of the, next, uh, the rest of this chapter and the next one. Just give you an interesting open door to it of what's, what's taking place. Again, there's a lot of political intrigue in these two chapters and it's hard to explain it without doing it all but you have to work your way through it and so the question comes down to who exactly is this what exactly is it is a city or tied to a city something very corrupt very rich historically political though not claiming to be political um, has spread worldwide looks like ancient Babylon in what she does spawned other religious systems that have produced falsehoods, persecuted true believers. She's post-New Testament, came into being sometime after the New Testament was done. Is this your possibility? Is it possible that there was a 
Christian, a form of Christianity that has become very corrupt in its teaching? And did they spawn other religious systems that did the same thing? Yeah, yeah, okay. You have other groups that have, that have some done well, others have persecuted just the same as the church. Am I convinced this is what it is? Kinda. Seems to be. Um, seems to be in play. But that's a possibility. In my mind, that's a strong possibility. Is it some future system that could come into play with the great apostasy? That's a possibility. I don't know. But this one does fit this up to this point. So with that positive statement in mind, let's get ready for real worship. Okay? We'll pick up next week and give you more information about these different characters.